many of you know Arturo is 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 a pleasure to have him back to to IMO even if it's only via Zoom. And many of you will know Arturo because clearly um, he was a he's a very well known scientist in the field, but also because he spent a few years at IMO. Uh, Arturo did his Arturo Araujo did his um, PhD at University College London under the supervision of Bas Baum and Peter Banley, which happened to also be mentors of mine uh, in my PhD as well. And um, after that, he, he actually joined IMO and uh, worked with us for a few years. Uh, he did some cool modeling, I think some of which we might see today. He got himself a DOD fellowship, which allowed to continue working on these ideas for a few more years, after which uh, he decided to um, go back to, to the UK, go back to London and uh, work in industry at uh, Braintree, which is a startup in artificial intelligence. He also had an honorary position at University College London, which allowed to have links to, to academic research. And after a few years uh, in, in between both uh, the corporate world and, and academia, he, he's now back to academia. He's now a lecturer, which is a um, faculty position at Wolverhampton University in London. And uh, we, we are looking forward to see um, what you've been working in the last few years, Arturo. Please take it on. Super. Well, thank you guys for having me over. It's been a while. I wish I could be there in person, but um, hopefully soon. Um, what have I been doing? Um, well, um, I think the first thing that I that I should tell you about is all the things that I've learned. Um, as David said, I've been doing AI for almost three years now with all of these brilliant people. Uh, I have learned a lot from them working on different projects that are not cancer related. For instance, I learned how to use different kinds of um, sorting algorithms to help redistribute Santander bikes throughout London. I have seen how to use some artificial intelligence methods like machine learning to figure out what kind of mayonnaise people are going to be liking next year based on migration patterns. It's been an interesting ride. And I think I've learned a little bit of how the industry works, a little bit of how um, artificial intelligence could help not just cancer, but the field of biology uh, and the field of medicine, which I feel it's, it's, it, it is lying a little bit behind uh, the, the frontiers of IT. And I think what I'm going to be doing now is I'm going to take those things that I've learned and mm, bring it back to biology. Um, that's my five-year plan and we'll catch up again in five years and hopefully we'll see if that has materialized. But in the meantime, I have been trying to keep up with my research. Um, if, if you remember the last time we saw each other, we were talking about prostate cancer to bone metastasis, which is all the work that I did at the IMO, where we did tackle, I think, fairly successfully, the role of uh, stromal factors in prostate cancer to bone metastasis and all of the um, microenvironmental cells and how they um, influence the way the disease progresses. Um, if you all remember, we created um, an interesting um, agent-based model that captured, I think, the essence of how this disease starts, which is, um, I think it was like the first time we all really saw how this vicious cycle actually starts. And once you're able to visualize how the vicious cycle actually starts, then you can start thinking about ways to curing it or hindering it. Um, not, not by attacking the cancer itself, but maybe by being a little bit um, a little bit more proactive and, and tackling the communication between the cells. That's how we proposed uh, transforming growth factor beta inhibition as a potential therapy, all of this with David, um, Conor Lynch, and of course, Leah Cook, which now she is an assistant professor in Nebraska Medical Center, um, doing, I think, a lot of things are, that are going to be very relevant for us in the next few years, uh, including some of the microenvironment into these kinds of models. But today I am here to highlight, highlight, highlighting 
<laughs> the role of uh, cell division. Um, so in the next 30, 40 minutes, I, I want to review some of the evidence um, that I've gathered in the last three years, and maybe a little bit, I think, um, in, in my time at Moffitt, that places cell division as one of the key things to get right when we're modeling cancer, especially if we're building bottom-up bottom models, uh, integrating first principles. And the question is, um, if we take the knowledge that other people have, have extracted for us, because they have done a lot of these experiments, they have done all of these research, um, can we just take that research at, at face value as it is, and then use that in an integrative kind of holistic model to, to then be able to bridge not only their data, but data from other people that have gathered at different, at different scales. Ideally, we should be able to do this, but um, we will discuss the limitations of using this very basic data, especially cell division data, in light of trying to power clinical decision-making, which I think uh, is where this research might be heading to. And, and when I say cell division is what's driving all of these models, um, it is because basically cancer cells, which are like normal cells, is what they do. They just divide. Two cells divide into four, four cells divide into eight, and then as they divide, they self-organize to create tissues, and then these tissues self-organize to create organs, and then these organs self-organize into organisms. Um, and there's, there's a lot of cells working together to try to keep us alive. And it is, of course, um, the focus of cancer research to understand what happens when one of these cells starts misbehaving, not cooperating. Uh, maybe there's, I think, many definitions of what a cancer cell is, but a cancer cell, I think the main, the main thing that worries us is that it divides too much. And by, the, by dividing too much, it generates this bulk, um, which we call tumors, and what we are trying to, we're trying to understand uh, before we can cure them. So, so, so starting from this premise that um, all cells divide, but cancer cells divide the most. Um, a lot of treatments have been devised to um, utilize this fact so that, for instance, with chemotherapy or other kinds of agents that interfere with cell division, then the cells that divide the most die, presumably the cancer cells. Are, and even so these systemic treatments affect all of the body, um, the idea is that because cancer cells are dividing the most, then they should be the most affected. So with all of these treatments, there are side effects. Um, and I think with mathematical modeling, we can start dividing, we can start devising better alternatives um, or, bet or, or, or better use treatments that are already available there to minimize the patient discomfort um, try to bring some quality of life and extend life is possible. So one of the things that we've discussed a lot in the IMO uh, is cancer heterogeneity. And I posit here that if we know how fast cancer cells divide, then we can distinguish them. So we can actually tease out some of the heterogeneity inside of the tumor. Or, because usually or, when cancer cells change their division rate, and they do so in response to pressures from the microenvironment. So I do wonder if we can take this basic cellular knowledge and then build a bottom-up model that yields tissue level dynamics um, just, by, just, just by changing different kinds of cell, of cell division. So let's start our odyssey with the gastrointestinal tract, which is a tube that connects your mouth to your bum. Um, Food goes in, it gets processed in your stomach, and then it comes out on the other end. Uh, normally, it all works. Um, it all works great, but sometimes in the colon, um, which is this part here, uh, uh, 
some malignant transformations may happen leading to colon cancer, um, which is last time I checked the third leading um, cancer death related incidents in the world. Uh, the problem I think here is that again, we don't really know how it starts. Um, luckily, I think um, I have been trying to keep up with the literature and I do see that there is a lot of recent developments on how cancer starts and it all points at cancer starting in these imbachinations that line the um, that line the, col the, the, the colon, the gastrointestinal tract, the gastrointestinal tube. Um, these colon cribs there, are, they're, they're, they're like indentations in all of these, in, in all of the lining that provide new cells for the colon to replenish itself because it gets eroded with all of the uh, residual um, food that passes through it. Um, now, here's our first mistake. Um, Sir Professor Nicholas Wright has pointed out that the intestinal lining um, doesn't have villi. So I had to go back and redraw this. But now, thanks to Sir Nicholas Wright, we have the correct diagram. It doesn't really change the model. It's just the diagram of the model. The model is we have these imaginations. And in these imaginations that are like cylinders um, lining all of, the, all of the intestinal tract, we have cells at the bottom um, that are represented here as green cells are called stem cells. And these stem cells, they're cells that divide uh, frequently so that they can then start differentiating are uh, represented here in yellow as transamplifying cells. And then by the time they reach the, the actual lining of the gut, they become or epithelial cells that all they're gonna do is they're gonna keep the organ in a sustained physical structure. Um, all of this work is a collaboration that I'm doing with Professor Albert Rubin from uh, University Hospital in Aachen, Germany. So he's providing all of this clinical and biological um, expertise to fill in the gaps um, I'm bridging in all of the data that we're trying to get from, from you know, all of the people that are doing a lot of great research in this area, including Trevor Graham, Andreas Toriva, um, and, and some um, other non-local researchers. Um, but we're bridging all of this with the help of computer science, which is where computer science comes in. So Peter Bentley is helping with his agent-based modeling uh, expertise, making sure that everything is working in an efficient way, that there are no bugs in the code. And the way that we decided to model this is if we have a cylinder and we open the cylinder up, so it becomes like a sheet. It's like a two-dimensional sheet that represents a three-dimensional three structure, which is very lucky for us because then that makes the computation a lot easier. So in this model, what we're trying to figure out is what affects monoclonality. So if you look at the model, then each cell has an identity at the base. So I'm, I'm calling each cell um, by a number. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight cells. Um, at some point, just through cell division, these cells will push all the other cells because that's what they do normally. They just uh, divide, push a cell, and then um, the cells that are being pushed go up in the crypt up until they reach the epithelium at which point they're going to be shed away with the rest of the food and poo and all of that stuff um, so that's what the model that's what the model does each cell has a little algorithm that tells it who they are they are all share the same algorithm that's responding to extracellular cues. So cues from the microenvironment. One of them uh, is um, WNT, which is a um, molecular gradient that keeps the cells in a STEMI state, according to most literature that we've um, 
that we've gathered. And there's another growth factor that plays a key role called the epithelial growth factor that mm, it, it encourages cell division. So the more there is, then the more cells will divide. And we believe uh, that these factors are maximum at the bottom. And you can see here that went only is uh, short reaching, but everything that's made in this wind signal, it's green, it's a stem cell. The EGF, it's a more far reaching gradient and everything that's in that EGF gradient uh, is dividing. And as, it's, as it divides, it loses telomeres, it loses the ability to divide, um, but also um, it creates a bulk, a bulk of cells that will be used then later um, to cover up the epithelial tissue, which is uh, the red part here. And by the time they reach that, they don't know, they no longer divide uh, and they just sit there until they're washed away, providing some solid structure. So that's really what each one of these cells do. They, they just say, am I inside the wind gradient? If not, then am I inside the EGF gradient? Uh, if not, then I'm just gonna die. But if I am inside the wind gradient, then I divide according to um, according to a stem cell, and I can divide as many times as I want, maybe once every 24 hours. Or if I am um, inside of the EGF gradient, well, how much EGF gradient do I have? If I have lots, then I'll be able to divide frequently, maybe maybe almost every 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 12 hours. But if I don't have as much, then I'll divide less. So maybe once every 24 hours. Um, and the way that I divide, I, there's a probability of pushing cells to the side. There's probability of pushing cells up, which is preferential. Um, all of which has been extracted, extracted by um, researchers, by Alex Fletcher, Ritzma, um, Cosart, Hugo, Hugo Snippert. Um, so thank you to all of these researchers because I could just take all of those values, put them in the model and it works. Um, so all of the things that each one of these researchers are extracted individually in their experiments, I was able to put in this model and I was able to get um, a homeostatic tissue that, uh, that behaves uh, what you would expect a normal crypt to behave. But instead of doing the experiment in the, in the laboratory as some people are, as some people do, and, and you know, thank you so much for their work. Uh, I can do these experiments now that I have a faithful model in just a few seconds. And I can test all the different things, measure all the different things that can't be measured in, in the laboratory, like I can, I can ask, well, how many times have a cell divide, has a cell divided? How old are they? Um, how more can they divide? Um, but importantly, what I really want to know here is uh, when is one of the stem cells going to become the answer? Arturo, the entire I... <laughs> Absolutely. So a previous slide, if you just go back one. So uh, am I right that I'm reading this, that the, it almost looks like all the cells can divide sort of the similar amount because they're all sort of orangey shred. There's no, because my impression was the crypt that was more stem driven and the action was more at the base than all the way up. What? What are you? What you're seeing here is the same. Well, it's 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 the same crypt, just different visualizations of the crypt. So sure. to the far to the far right, we see the normal crypt, um, which is it, it it has different kinds of divisions, and then the number of division is just how many times have I divided throughout throughout my life. The age sure. is how old I am. But I guess what I'm um, saying is there's no stem-like phenotype for in your the base of your crypt and there's no main driver. The, 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 the only thing that I'm considering STEMI about it is that it can divide as many times as it wants, whereas other cells throughout it can only divide five times at most. And 
Right, so and then it looks like somebody was a 20, 28, and you know, so I don't see them being five times. Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Could you repeat the question? So you've got mitosis on the left and it's all at five, right? But then you've got number of divisions. Is that number of divisions in that location as opposed to by that cell? Uh, in that case, it is by location. Right, okay. What I was... Um, I was using this just as an illustration. No, no, we sure. Run okay, the model fine. If, can... if you're just using it as an illustration, I won't pester you about it anymore. Thanks. <laughs> mm. But what, what I really wanted to find out was uh, when will one of the cells at the bottom become the ancestor of all of the cells in the crypt? Um, so once that I've verified that this behaves like a, like a normal crypt, um, people like, like Hugo Snippert have measured, um, have measured exactly this. When, when will um, stem cell at the base will become the ancestor of the rest? And this is called, this is called monoclonality. When will it reach monoclonality? And he's measured, they, they've measured, um, that most scripts um, become monoclonal in an 80 day, 80 day, 80 to 100 day uh, period of time. Uh, at, 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 at that point, even though there's a lot of variation, some, some, some become monoclonal earlier than others, most would become monoclonal by that time. And there's this really nice curve that they've developed and that we've been able to reproduce just with these very basic assumptions. Um, so we were able to then ask, what are the biggest contributing factors that affect, the mon that affect monoclonality? Um, one of them being the number of basal stem, basal stem cells. So if you have more basal stem cells than the time to, to monoclonality is a lot longer than if you have less, which actually I think makes a big difference because some of the experiments that are being done in uh, murine, murine lab animals have less basal stem cells than humans. So the murines are between four and six and humans are between six and eight. And that actually makes quite a big difference. So if you're gonna have if you're gonna incorporate uh, knowledge that we've gathered from urine, uh, from urine experiment, then we have to convert them into human experiments. So you can't just take the face value result and then transform it into a human result. You have to do some conversion. And that actually affects the time to, mon to monoclonality. Um, that also pl plays a little bit into cancer because some of the cancer crypts are enlarged and Presumably, they have a larger number of basal stem cells. Um, but that is still, I think the jury is still out on that. And the other one is, um, the other big biggest contributing factor is actually, it's actually not that much to do with division, but actually the proportion of cell displacement. So if a cell decides that instead of preferentially dividing up, which I don't think at this point, we really know why they preferentially um, divide up other than basic physics, um, there might be something to do with polarization that allows cells to divide sideways more frequently. And that actually is one of the biggest contributors to the changing the curve of monoclonality, which will come into play a little bit later because the implication for colorectal cancer here is, well, if one of these, if one of the cells in the colon crypt gets mutated into a cancer cell, but it's in the middle of the crypt, it doesn't really matter because it's going to get washed away. But if one of these cancer cells starts as a, as a stem cell, then the possibility that it'll stay 
fix their stem cell and that it'll become the ancestor of the whole of the crypt, so it'll become a clonal, is pretty high. And that I think could be one of the ways that colorectal cancer might start. So um, the idea here is can we actually quantify the probability that one of these um, ancestors of the colorectal cancer mutations will be fixated in the crypt. And again, some people have done some research on this um, and have done some quantifications. And we're trying, we're, we're gonna try to hit their, 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 their quantification with this, with this model of homeostasis. And for that, we needed to understand a little bit more what the two pathways that we are modeling are actually doing inside of the cell. So um, we did this work with some master students that I supervise at UCL where I asked them, can you help um, tease out some of the complex molecular pathways that are involved in some of the most frequent mutations like KRAS or APC? KRAS is um, involved with cell division and APC, even though it has been involved a little bit with cell division, it's actually more involved um, with cell displacement and stemness because if you see in the pathway here, um, the EGF pathway goes straight through KRAS and affects cell division uh, instead of the nucleus membrane, whereas WINT, which is the other STEMI pathway that we're considering, that actually also changes the way that cells divide, uh, operates through catenin beta-1 that then affects cell displacement too. So uh, another of our students, Kate Bostock, took all of this biological um, rationale and transformed it into an algorithm that now each one of the cells have. So each one of the cells now has a little algorithm with the, um, <clears throat> all of these different genes inside. And each one of these genes um, in principle is based on an oncogene or a tumor suppressor gene. Um, for now, we're just gonna focus on two, which are gonna be KRAS and APC because that's the data that we have. And in the future, we're going to assume that um, some of the other genes function in a similar way, but I'm sure there's a lot of differences that we're going to need to tease out. So, so for now, just bear with me. We're just going to do KRAS and APC. Um, even though Sorry, we can do um, all of Arturo, yeah, yeah. just one question. Um, Adam <clears throat> McLean, I don't know, Adam, you, you want to ask the question yourself or, or you just want to hear your own question in a funny Spanish accent? <laughs> I mean, this, the, the, the latter sounds better, but sure, I'm happy to ask it myself. <laughs> um, I was just a quick question about the model. I was wondering if the cells can only move in one direction or if they can move back down the crypts. And if so, if they gain stemness characteristics, there's like quite a lot of recent evidence that suggests that sort of motion might be possible. And this is going to affect the clonal dynamics a lot. In this model, CRIP um, cells can move, can move downwards with a very small, with a very, with a, with a smaller probability. Um, except, except, except at the base. If you're at the base, you can't move. If you can't move. And if you move, sure. And if, but if you move downwards, do you can you gain stemness? Yeah. So, so, so the way the model is working is if you are in contact with. If you're in contact with the wind gradient, then you are a stem cell. So if you move back from the transient amplifying compartment, you stop being a transient amplifying cell and become a stem cell again. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Hey, Arturo, it's Heiko. Can I follow up with a question, please? Yes. So, so I, I'm interested in your monoclonal conversion, uh, stem cells replacing other stem cells at the bottom of the crypt. How do you model mm -hmm. that? Do we have a stem cell randomly dying and then the other cells competing for that space? Or do we have a stem cell dividing and then at random replacing any of its adjacent neighbors? Stem cells divide and, and replace their neighbors by pushing them. Um, I am in this version of the model, not considering death in the stem cell compartment. Um, so it's all done just by 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 pushing cells. Okay, so, so if, if you do that, and if you run your simulations uh, over a long time, you can reach monoclonality just by stochastics, right? Without putting any gene network inside the cell. So oh, what yeah, are you trying? Yeah. So, so 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 we can probably cycle back later. What your motivation is to put a gene network into the cells now? 
Well, the motivation is to understand or partially to understand how how different mutations would affect the different or the different dynamics. So, so there's there are papers that say Keras makes cells divide faster, uh, and thus they're able to colonize the crypt, um, spread 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 the um, spread the mutation throughout the crypt, so become more clonal. But they they don't really link it up. They 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 have measured it in a global um, in a in a global in a global way. And what I want to do by incorporating this um, genes inside of each cell is to see if it actually is true. If it's actually if if the assumptions that the researchers are making actually hold through, which is if KRAS is mutated, it'll divide faster, and just by dividing faster, it'll have this rate of monoclonality, which it doesn't. Okay. <laughs> okay. Looking forward to seeing it. Thanks, Antonio. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right. So we can we and we get the we get the monoclonality just by just by just by just by drift, um, and we're hoping to just quickly incorporate all of these genes and then say. These genes have been implicated in cell division. So if we mutate these genes, then this is the probability of fixation. Um, and we tried that and it, it, we, get, we get these results that are not quite right. So if we compare this data with the data from, from Vermeulen from 2013, that hopefully uh, we'll be able to get better data soon. Um, well, it doesn't quite get that kind of probability of fixation. So, 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 so there, there's something there that we're missing. It, the, the model is pointing to a gap in our, in our understanding of either how KRAS works or how monoclonality works. Um, and for this, I have tasked I have tasked Frederick Russo, who is a UCL computer scientist, to figure out. Um, what would we actually need to get in terms of either either an alteration in the division um, via KRAS or an alteration inside displacement by APC to actually get the numbers that Bermulian is reporting. And he's done an excellent job in getting all of this data for us. And our conclusion for this is that uh, KRAS would have to increase the vision by almost 100%. So it's like pushing the cell to the maximum so that it can reach that kind of probability of fixation that is being reported in the literature. Um, APC would have also to increase through the um, wind pathway or uh, side displacement a lot, um, a lot more than I think we think um, we 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 initially thought it 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 would. So all of these investigations are still ongoing. Um, these are all the results that we have at the moment, and hopefully we'll get them published soon and we get some feedback. But from here, I think um, the 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 idea was we're just modeling one crypt. It'd be great if we could model a thousand crypts, so we can actually model a little bit of a segment, which is what Freddie is doing um, by coding all of this in a very efficient way. And this actually, um, even though it's really nice to have that that one crypt resolution, which can actually see how by introducing just the one mutation in the one cell, then the one cell outcompetes these other cells. Um, Ideally, then we would be introducing all of these different mutations, combination of mutations, and then we can actually uh, we can actually simulate um, and, and and see the way we the, the way we're able to visualize the vicious cycle and its and its beginnings. We can visualize how cancer would start from just the one crypt and going into all of these patches of crypts. Um, and spreading all of these mutations, and then we could see, we could in principle see all of these evolutionary dynamics that a lot of 
a lot of researchers have pointed at, but I don't think anybody has actually really seen it spread from, from just the one mutation in the one cell all in, in, into the whole tissue and the whole tumor, um, which is my goal for the next, in the next two or three years, hopefully. Um, but we're not done with the intestinal tract. We're now gonna just shift focus a little bit and talk a little bit about Barrett's esophagus, which I think Kid was here talking to you a little bit about how um, some of these cells that make up your esophagus begin to look like cells that make up your intestines, which is called Barrett's esophagus. And again, the beginnings of this is not really clear. Um, the theory is that these cells may be damaged by exposure to acid from the stomach, but we don't know how it starts. Um, or and, and even worse, we don't really know once it's there, we don't know how long it's been there because most of the patients, when they come with Barrett's esophagus, they've had it for a while. So it's really hard to, to tease out how it starts. Um, Kit has actually um, has actually done a lot of research um, and discovered that, that Barrett's esophagus must be the precursor of many, if not all, the esophageal adenocarcinoma. So now the question of how it starts is actually pretty pressing. Now talking to Kit, um, who now has her own laboratory, um, and she's doing all of this research um, exactly on this. We're talking about, well, wouldn't it be great if we could actually age the tissue and then see different kinds of, test different kinds of theories of how it starts. And I said, I have just got the thing. I have this, I have this crypt model. And what we're doing is we're modeling the cylinder, which is the crypt. Um, and I have cells that are coming from the bottom up. But what we could do instead is we, we, we transform that model into a cylinder, which is, which is the esophageal tract. And we test all of these hypotheses. Um, if there are cells that are being damaged from the bottom of the esophageal tract, where it's, it's called the GEJ junction, due to acid reflux, and then these cells are migrating up um, at a certain rate, and they're fusing with other crypts, or they're dividing and creating other crypts, creating new patches, then um, we could model roughly um, how old would the patches be if certain scenarios are happening in, in, this, in this theory of acid reflux starting by its esophagus. Um, so she has done a lot of work uh, creating a statistical model of how this uh, aging in Barrett's esophagus would work um, and has a lot of interesting, interesting data. And you can see here that she said um, that it's more likely that uh, cells at the bottom are younger and they age as, as they go up in the esophagus. Uh, which she has modeled here with different colors and doing a, a complex Bayesian statistical model. And I sought to replicate this with this basically cellular automata model saying, we have different scenarios where we can either grow an entire, we, we can grow an entire esophageal tract and see how long it takes for it to grow according to what we know. Um, of, of crypt and patch division. Um, and we can see if by injuring some of the cells, we can, we can get the same results that she's observing in, in some of her patients. The, pro the problem with, with some of the results that, that she has is that it's very, very hard to distinguish chronological time versus division time, which is migration rate versus fission rate, which is are they all because they have lingered a lot or are they all because they have divided a lot, which is, is there migration from the base of the G, E, J, um, or is the segment already established there and there is just a very high turnover because there is a lot of acid reflux um, affecting it. Um, so we sat down, we, um, we tried 
to come up with a basic model of how this would work. And she came up with the idea of having an alpha probability of division um, of, of these patches and, and a beta, which is a probability of patch death. And then she tasked me with growing these segments from one from, from day one, where there is no really a, there's not really a segment there, it's just the GEJ interacting with the acid from the stomach. And then seeing what happens, say a year later or three years later, or more likely 50 years later, which is when some of these patients start showing up. And then we can actually trace some of these things back. We, um, we, we set different scenarios, and this is really what this model is going to help with, just to, to, to tell us which scenario is the most likely one. Was the patch already there or not? Is there, is the, is the acid reflux affecting cell division or patch division or not? Um, if we only have, say, um, a gradient of this acid reflux um, that affects both dead and division, um, maybe it's a different gradient. Maybe it only affects dead and not division. Maybe it affects division and not dead. Um, and the problem is we don't really know. And, and it's really, really hard to do an experiment on this because uh, the experimental conditions, I think, are, are, are very, very hard. You can't, really, you can't really create one of these tracts um, in vitro and in vivo. It's very, very hard to keep animals alive for 50 years, where, which is the time scale that this disease kind of spreads. Um, and even though this story is, is, is still, we're still, Kit and I, talking about it, um, one of the preliminary results is that from all of the scenarios that we tested, um, growing from, from the bottom does not capture the, the, the result that she's observing. So the model, uh, the model points to it already being established as a segment really quickly, maybe in, within a year, um, up to at least six centimeters. And then once it's once the segment's established, then it's been it's been transformed by a gradient of facet reflux that, that then leads to this tissue transformation and migration, um, which again points to methylation, clock methylation, which I think she talked about um, in her talk, which I think is also on YouTube. So I'll just refer you to their to her talk as a risk marker. But this is mostly her story. Uh, but Again, this points at a key role for cell division, which is every time I go to a conference, um, I have like a little batch uh, that's like, I am, I'm really interested in cell division. And in different conferences, especially some of the local ones um, that I have the privilege to attend to, like the, um, the UCL ones, I, I, I started chatting with a couple of researchers, Maria Secrier, um, who has a lab in genetics, uh, who actually just won a, a really prestigious award for future leaders here in Innovate UK. So, you know, good for her. Follow her on, on, on Twitter. Um, she is a very good person to, to follow, pointing, pointing to all of these different resources. And Professor Chris Barnes, um, who is also interested in something that I'm very interested in, errors during cell division which I think I, we, we have discussed a little bit, especially with um, Andre. Um, aneuploidy chromosome misregulation. So what happens if you have a set of genes, which you know now all of my cells have, and you just misegregate one of those um, chromosomes with all of the genes that, have, um, that that chromosome has. So, so what I did is I took the cells that I had in my, in my colon crypt and I placed them in, in just like a Petri dish. And I've tried to refine what each one of these genes does. Um, and again, I'm focusing on, on oncogenes, which are red and tumor suppressors, which are blue, um, and some genes that are necessary for, for basic cellular functions. Um, without really knowing how these genes are connected because nobody really knows, um, I just had, an initial 
initial initial diagram of how these genes could be connected. So if anybody wants to collaborate on this, it'd be fantastic if they could point me to the actual gene regulatory network that that um, we think determines um, the cancer that you are studying. But in this very abstract scenario, what I, what I want to know is if I have these missegregation events, um, and I know that these genes are in these chromosomes, then which are the missegregation events um, that I'll be most interested in? So which are the, are the genotypes that emerge and more, that are more prevalent? Um, obviously, we need a baseline model, which is or if I just leave the, 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 the cells there in a Petri dish without any mutations or chromosome segregations, then they should have like a homeostatic behavior. And if I injure them, then they should just recover and then continue being homeostatic. But then if I mutate one of those genes or if I alter the copy numbers of all of these genes, in a very, very abstract way, for instance, if I don't have the gene, then it's really not producing any of the gene signal. So probably whatever it's supposed to be doing is not, it's not, it's not being done. Um, if I have two copies of the gene, which are the normal ones, and it does what it should be doing, which is keeping homeostasis. And then if I have more of those copies and it's, it's doing more of the thing that it should be doing. So for instance, if it's an oncogene, it's promoting, it's promoting cell division. If it is a tumor suppressor, then it's, it's promoting, um, it's promoting uh, cell death or, or at least cell arrest. So it doesn't divide anymore. Um, so these are, are biologically inspired. I, I wasn't able to actually extract a number because I don't think we know any numbers yet. Um, hopefully that will change in the future, but even with this, very basic assumptions, I could get um, consistency in the kind of genes that are frequently mutated and that survive the harsh conditions uh, of selection. But, but importantly, I think what I found was that chromosome segregation might actually have a more consistent signature. So we'd actually, we can actually distinguish if, if we can if we can get this information early in tumor evolution, we can distinguish which one is driving um, the tumor, either mutations or, or chromosome segregations. And probably it's gonna be a mixture of both. Um, but that leads back to uh, something that is a little bit more concrete, which is the team science. Um, I was actually gonna put one of those um, sketches that I did for this um, back in the day when we were trying to come up with this image, because in this image, I actually had very specific people in mind. Um, so in collaboration with Dr. Julio from the Moffitt Clinic, and then in collaboration with Dr. Shilpa Gupta, which at the time was at Moffitt, but now it's at Cleveland. Um, Leah in the part of the bio, biochemical staining and Dr. Connor Lynch um, overseeing everything. And of course, David in the middle, um, binding everything together and making sure that we're all uh, getting along. We actually got this to work. And it was a, it, it, it was a very successful collaboration that, that again, centers around the idea of, um, of cell division. Um, so, so, for, for a clinical model, we also have to start modeling therapies. And that is the thing that I think took us the longest just to get right what is, um, what are the palliative therapies, um, like um, in the case of prostate cancer to bone metastasis, radiation to, to reduce the bulk of the tumor or chemotherapy to actually try to tackle the tumor, which we discussed earlier in the presentation. Um, or androgen deprivation treatment, which is um, it's trying to tackle um, cell cancer cell growth by inhibiting these growth factors that they need to survive and to grow. But inevitably, these cells become resistant to it, and once these cells become resistant to that androgen deprivation treatment, um, they have come up with a newer kind of androgen deprivation treatment, which is called a second line 
androgen deprivation treatment. Um, and we had access to, to samples that were pre-abiraterone, pre which is the second generation treatment, and post-abiraterone. And from those, we could actually extract the, um, the growth rates of all of these different cells. So some of them we already knew from, from researchers that have extracted this information before us. So for instance, we know, we know how fast prostate cancer cells divide and how much they die. And we do know roughly how much um, cells that are resistant to androgen deprivation treatment or to, um, or to chemotherapy uh, divide and die. That is a little bit different from, from the naive population, but we didn't know anything about the androgen deprivation treatment too. So we had to go androgen deprivation treatment too, in this case being abiraterone, go into the samples, extract all of these numbers, convert all of those numbers that are cellular numbers into growth rates and death rates. And just through extracting all of this data, we're able to construct this model where we have a logistic growth for all of these different kinds of cells. And the only thing that distinguishes them is how fast they grow, depending on whether they're resistant to a certain treatment or not. So we can see that the naive ones in black are gonna be the ones that grow the fastest. And um, cells that are resistant to the first generation androgen deprivation treatments in red are not gonna grow as fast as the naive ones. And the ones are, that are chemotherapy resistant are even, are, are even growing at a, at a slower pace. So the idea here is that resistance is translated into a cost of cell division. Um, so once we have this theoretical model, um, we can use it to try to mimic some of the things that have, uh, well, some, some, some of the things that, that, that the standard of care says we should be doing. So for instance, we can, if we have just naive cells, we can apply androgen deprivation treatment. Um, but soon, if you see figure B, this red line of, of resistance cells emerges. And then once that emerges, we can apply a second kind of treatment like androgen deprivation two treatment, which is in figure H. So you can see that then we apply the androgen deprivation treatment, but then you get resistance to that deprivation treatment. So we try all of these different scenarios where you have all of these different treatments. And for each treatment that you apply, you, you put some pressure on the cells. Some of the cells die according to the rates that we got uh, from our samples but some of them are transformed into a resistant variant that divides a little bit slower. Um, so the problem was when we were trying to then use this data that we have, that it's all cellular data and transform into something that is clinical. And this was actually one of the biggest hurdles that we had because the thing that is measured in the clinic routinely is PSA, which is prostate specific antigen that in principle, in principle, most of the cancer cells from the prostate uh, express. They express it natively in the prostate, but they express it in the tumor at a higher concentration. And we estimated that it's probably about 3.5 nanograms per mil of PSA per gram per day. Um, which is a little bit different than they would normally express. Um, and then we have to do um, another calculation, which is, well, uh, how, how much is just the one metastatic pro prostate cancer cells, uh, one metastatic prostate cancer cell produce? Um, because we're dealing with cell numbers, we want to know how many of these cells are actually, how much PSA uh, all of these cells are actually producing. If you guys remember, I did many months ago said that PSA 
it, it, it is like an abstract, abstract measurement. It is, I, 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 equated it, I equated it to a lightsaber. I think I even brought a lightsaber to show, to demonstrate the point. The point is, or will no lightsaber exist? Um, you know, you can hold a replica of a lightsaber, but it's not really a lightsaber because lightsabers don't really exist. And it's the same point, I think, with PSA. PSA is an abstract measurement. It's just something that we're trying to use to gauge how big the tumor is. There are a lot of problems with using PSA. Um, one of them is some of the cells may stop producing PSA at some point. Um, but the idea with this conversion is that it doesn't matter what you're using to transform cellular numbers and division rates into, into the clinical outcome. Um, in the future, I do expect that we'll be using different markers, like for instance, hopefully, um, microenvironmental cells, can we correlate microenvironment to tumor burden or can we correlate our immune response to tumor burden? And then using a mixture of all of these, of all of these correlations. Papa and Mama wollen jetzt essen. Pardon? I, I think that that's Philip and he has kids at home and sometimes these things happen, so don't worry about it. Ah, super. <laughs> uh, I thought that somebody was going to provide me with more data. Maybe as well, but uh, uh, I wouldn't count well, that right now. Hopefully this video in YouTube will be seen by millions and somebody will provide us with, with better data and say, hey, we have the right thing to link your model to the clinical data, and then it's going to be great. That's the hope. Uh, but as it is, uh, even though PSA is imperfect and even though it doesn't really exist um, as, a per as a perfect cor like correlation between tumor burden, um, um, and a molecular market marker, um, it is what it is what has been used in the clinic to assess uh, to assess tumor burden, and we also calculated that then, if all of your bones had if all of your bones had prostate cancer, then the maximum theoretical carrying capacity for bone metastases are. Uh, is, is a PSA of about 1,000, which has never been observed. So I think, um, has it, well, I think, I think it has not, it's not, it has not been observed, but I may, I, I may be wrong. Um, I'm gonna track back in, on, I'll soften that comment and say, a thousand nanograms per mil is probably gonna be um, the cut off, the maximum capacity, um, that, that I think a body can handle of cancer in the bones because that is the volume inside of the bones, um, which is going to be the current capacity of our of our of our tissue. And then we can go we can go to the to the clinic um, and ask, can we can we try to recapitulate some of the patient data that is completely different. From, from, from the data that we've used to, to parameterize this model. Can, can you just give us um, the, the PSA that a patient presented with and, and, the, and the treatment that they had? And that's what they gave us. They gave us um, um, a, um, a set of patients, um, for instance, in this case, this patient presented initially with a PSA of 15, um, and then had some radiotherapy and then had some chemotherapy and then had some androgen deprivation therapy. Um, and the other, the, other, the other way around, first androgen deprivation therapy, then, radi then radiotherapy, then chemotherapy. Um, and we, we were able to recapitulate what happened to this patient uh, with our model, simulating all of the things, all of the, all of the, all of the different treatment scenarios and how they impact all of these different cells. But importantly, we can now mathematically test out which cells, um, when, 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 the disease when the disease became resistant, just by measuring how fast the cells are now, are now growing. So in, um, in panel B, you can see that we have all of the different PSA points and you can see that there's a dotted line that's joining them. Um, that is the PSA prediction by the model, but we can then decompose that PSA prediction into, into cells. 
So there's the, the naive cells, assuming that the patient presented um, with 100% cells, cell naivete. So there was no treatment there, no resistance initially there. And then through all of the treatments that uh, he received, um, the, the cells started to change into this resistant phenotype that that divides a little bit different. And you know, we can see the change. Um, remember, the only thing that, that, that is different between these two phenotypes is, is, a, is a, the rate of division. Um, we can see the change if we, if we assume that the patient was actually resistant to begin with, then we have a completely different curve, which completely misses the mark in all of the PSA points that we get. Um, so we can, we can be fairly sure that this patient presented close to naivete to these treatments because he responded pretty well to all of these treatments. Um, but then we encountered some of the patients um, that did, um, the model did not quite capture what was happening with them. So for instance, we assume in this patient um, that initially it presented with 100% naivete to treatments um, and, and, and the model doesn't do a very good job of recapitulating them. But if we assume now that it was 100% resistant to begin with, then the model recapitulates what is happening to the patient. And you can see here that we've dec decomposed the PSA into this initial red line. So there is no, there is no black line here, it's all red. And it reacted well to the surgery, but then with the, with the um, androgen deprivation treatment one, it didn't really, it didn't really work because probably he was already resistant to this, um, to this treatment. So we did this for the set of patients that we were given, which was 23 patients. And we run the model with different levels of initial resistance to just androgen deprivation treatment one. Um, if we run this 11 times with different levels of resistance, say starting with 100% naivete and then a ratio of 10% cells were naive and 90% were resistant and so on, all the way to 100% cells were resistant and there were no naive cells, then we can see that at least one of those curves approaches what the patient, um, what the patient went through in their course of, of treatments. If we select that, then we can, we can, um, we can say with, 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 with a grain of salt, the range was in this, in this, in this range of resistance, um, at least to this initial androgen provision treatment, which is one of the first lines of defense. Um, and we can decompose that into the evolution of the disease. So what happened to the disease, how it became resistant, how it changed, how, how it changed in their levels of, of division throughout, throughout the evolution of the disease um, in response to these treatments. And then once we have re recapitulated the history of the patient um, and explained a little bit what happened, um, then can we ask the computer, can you, can you design a treatment that takes this initial resistance into account and then calibrates, it, calibrates the treatments um, according to the standard of care still being deliver, delivered uh, by the book? But can, can you calibrate this so that we only administered enough of this treatment to keep everything under, say, a PSA of, a PSA of one? And the, the computer in, in, this, in this very rudimentary optimization approach actually extended the, extended the, the, the simulated life of the, of the patient um, again, assuming that is the bulk that the bulk of the tumor that actually is the problem, which it might not, but assuming that it is, then we can assume we, 
we can assume that maybe when the PSA gets, gets really, really high, that is when the life of the patient is being threatened. And by keeping the PSA as low as, low as we can, in this case for a couple of, uh, a couple of extra years, um, presumably the patient um, would gain some quality of life and some extra years in their life. Um, which is the idea again of personalized treatment? Can we, can we, can we do, can can we do all of this for every single patient, but not necessarily needing um, all of their history, but rather just starting with a with a presentation point and then calibrating the model as the patient receives their treatment, and as it as the patient comes back. Um, the model could get this information and recalibrate and recalibrate and recalibrate. Um, that is something that I dream of. Hopefully, um, hopefully one day I can I can I can take this project all the way into its its fruition. But I think at the moment we did we did we did contribute a little bit to at, at least in the local Moffitt clinic. I think. Um, to the way clinicians think about how they administer their treatments. Um, obviously, it'd be better if we incorporated the microenvironment. Um, we haven't simulated combined treatments, so that could be um, actually a very important thing on how they shape evolution, which is something that I'm very, very interested in, but I don't think we really know yet how the treatments combined affect the evolution. It could be something that could be tackled mathematically. Um, integrating the immune system is something that I am all for because there is actually, you can do very, very quick routine samples, um, sample extractions, and you can get a lot of data. And then you can use AI models to extract parameters and do some, um, and do some, some sensitivity estimation which I think would be great to then start tackling the mechanics of how it works and actually understanding how to stop this. And finally, I just want to, um, I think, um, summarize all the evidence um, that I've gathered that plays the vision at a central role when we're, we're building these bottom-up kinds of models in colorectal cancer um, through the vision. Um, we were able to tease out that, that KRAS has, a, has indeed a big chance of getting fixed by increased division, as some researchers have pointed to, but it actually it will probably be a lot more division than what's being reported currently. And that APC might, fixated, might, might get fixated not just by increased division, but actually by increased cell displacement. In virus esophagus, a gradient of acid reflux actually affects the growth um, which is the number of additions, an aging of uh, B segment that probably should be pre-established pretty quickly there. Um, in replication errors during the vision, like chromosome segregation, the identity of the chromosome that is missegregated actually can have a deep impact on the initial heterogeneity and the subsequent evolution. And in prostate cancer to bone metastasis, differences in cell division rates can be used to tease out and to utilize um, this estimation of resistance to design personalized treatments. Um, when I left Moffitt about three years ago, I gave one of these um, 3D printed little cell division models um, to David, Connor, and Leah uh, as a thank you for having me and to, teaching me all of this, which I've tried to carry on um, all of the teachings, um, all of the things that I've learned at the IMO in all of my work, um, focusing in, I think, more in cell division, um, but, but always with the ethos that models that first recapitulate homeostasis can help you uncover um, key things about how the disease actually start, um, including crucial changes in cell division. And like Sandy says, how can you start curing something that you don't understand first? And that is me. Hmm. So thanks so much for having me. Um, well, uh, 
Thank you very much, uh, Arturo. That was a great presentation. You covered a lot of ground uh, today. I was going to say this afternoon. Well, it's been years. Yes. Well, you know, it's, it's still it's still a lot of work, obviously, and um, uh, I know that people have been asking questions, but right now is just a good time to have maybe a couple of questions if people still have any at this stage. This is your time. Hey. Um, hey. Hi, Arturo. I had one question. If you can go back to your treatment adaptation or personalization slide. Mm -hmm. um, so right, uh, one more forward. So it seems like you're saying, my understanding is that you tried 11 different combinations of resistance at the beginning to see which of them match up best with the data and then you decided which of those you could use to adapt treatment. Yep. But if, if you said from the very beginning that they were all naive to ADT, why would you need to incorporate any type of resistance? Doesn't that possibly just um, imply that perhaps the model is wrong and maybe it needs to be changed in order to recapitulate that growth in the beginning and then you could simulate treatment? Well, it does capture a lot of the a lot of the patients that actually were were relatively naive to the first androgen deprivation treatment. We only incorporated this in in when when we started tackling cases that were probably resistant to begin with. I just think it's if you, if you only have confidence in one out of eleven of your simulations, I think it's dangerous to go ahead and start to do. Um, treatment personalization when you haven't really validated that the model is correct first? I think you're absolutely right. Ideally, we would be able to go back to the samples that we have and query them for our, for the prediction that the model is making. Um, I, I do think that, I, I, don't know if, I don't know if there's any way we can do that. Um, mm -hmm. Or other ways of validating of validating this. Um, I do think that the, the, you're absolutely right. We do need a more rigorous validation here um, to actually say this is what would this is a, a clinical clinically ready tool. But this is more this is more about integrating facts, biological facts, into something um, that into some into some general model. And then using that general model to see, um, to make some rough estimations and rough predictions of what would happen. Okay. All right. Thanks. Um, hi, Arthur. Really great talk. Thank you very much. Um, can you please clarify? In panel A, it says that the patient received 531 days of radiation. That's about a year and a half. No, 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 sorry. That that means that in day, 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 uh, where is it? Was it this one? Yeah, this one says 743. So, so this one says the patient received um, androgen deprivation treatment from day one to day 742. Yeah. And they, then on day 743, received radiotherapy just the once or... and then and then day 744 to 1096 uh, they resumed the androgen deprivation treatment um, and then they attempted they attempted surgery um, chemotherapy from day 1097 to 1182 Okay. and then surgery at, at the end. Okay, thank you. So I have a question, Arturo. That was um, very nice. Uh, I like the new work. There's lots of nice new avenues there. Um, I'll be intrigued to see which one you're actually going to focus on because that's a lot to be juggling. Um, but in regards to the kind of overall philosophy of proliferation and focused on proliferation, I think it's clear that that's central to cancer. But we've recently been sort of thinking a lot about death and the role of death in facilitating proliferation and facilitating selection. And you know, a good example of that is that a kind of birth-death process can give different results from a death-birth process. And if you think about that, 
just from your sort of aging base point of view, right? You know, filling holes where cells have died versus pushing or whatever and then dying, you can see how potentially you'll get different um, you know, distributions of cells. So have you looked at that aspect? Have you thought about the impact of increasing or decreasing death rates um, and potentially the role of context in modulating? Absolutely. Um, I think when when I mean when I mean division, what I mean is is not only the the number of cells that, that are dividing actively, but also the number of cells that are dying. So I guess, for instance, in this in this um, in this in this last model, what what, what we've encapsulated as, as as growth is the rate of proliferation. Um, which is the first gray column, and then the rate of apoptosis, because it also changes um, through different kinds of um, different kinds of cells, and and it's a balance between the two of them that I think gives rise to to, to what we observe as growth, as phenotype of growth. Um, in in respect to the other, whether it's filling in a gap or rather pushing, it, it has to do uh, I think a little bit with physics. And, and it is going to be a little bit harder to, to pinpoint that, but for sure, if if there if there is, for instance, a wound, um, and some there the, there is a gap there that needs to be filled, um, some of these pathways will activate and will try to fill in that gap, which I think leaves open the an avenue for for cancer to start. Um, I do feel. And this is more like an intuition. I don't know if there's any um, research actually being done, but I do. I do feel that when cells are dividing, they're at the at, at their most vulnerable and, and their most malleable. So when they're encouraged to divide, um, they might start disregarding some of the failsafe that they're that they that, that that are there for for them to not divide too much. Um, and sometimes once you open the floodgates, it's very hard to close them down. Yeah, I'm, I think one of the issues that I see is that proliferation takes time. It's a process you can stay for, you can see it in capture stages. The division's harder to see and catch, right? So you've got one marker here you're standing for that sort of captures some aspect of, of death. And there's potentially many others that we've missed and many others you don't see, right? Mm -hmm. So um, maybe it's not that important, but if you kind of imagine that there's much more death going on in between those snapshots, would it change your results? Because um, it potentially would mean that there is a greater turnover in this population. So but anyway, thanks. I think there's uh, definitely lots of directions to take this. And it sounds like you've got a really great collaborative team there that you're starting to build. So good luck with all. Thank you. Um, I do expect to um, submit a bunch of grants and get a, a lot of money. Um, <laughs> and um, fingers you know, spread spread the spread the knowledge. Um, pass on everything that I have learned. Um, and you know, hopefully, keep contributing to. Or the prevention and cure of cancer as much as as much as we can. And, um, I miss you guys. I miss all of these chats. Well, we're here. Yes. We'll have you back. Indeed. Yes, when we can travel again, maybe next year. Okay, Arturo, thank well, you very much. Catch each other on Twitter. Yes, yes. Uh, it, it helps a little bit. Uh, was there any Absolutely. other questions? I thought someone else had jumped up to the mic there, but maybe not. Ah. Oh. Hey, sorry. <laughs> sorry, apparently I had trouble unmuting it. Um, yeah, hey, Mohammed here. Uh, I had a quick question about your Burex esophagus, the application of the crypt model for that. So I noticed you were look, um, had this, uh, with the scale jump, you had to do those patches instead of per cell. So I had a couple of questions about that one how many cells is in a patch? And second, do you deal with any sort of like inter-patch or in 
inside of one patch heterogeneity or if not then how do you kind of justify everything being homogeneous within a given patch because i was really curious about how you did that the scaling because it's a much smaller problem right one crypt at a time versus you know a whole section of esophagus so a couple of questions rolled up there yeah i have i have a number for you here um, i'm just trying to get to the right slide but it's like a thousand a thousand crypts in a patch and then the patch here it is ah oh, missed it how can i go back mm. technology is failing me um that's right i mean so that means in the in the original crypt model each unit was a was not a cell it was a it was a yeah. patch Ah, uh, okay. So that's model, it, each round thing is a cell. In the Barrett's okay. esophagus, each square is a patch of, I think it's 150 micrometer square, and it's like a thousand crypts inside of each patch. And, okay. and the only thing that I'm asking is, is how fast does it, does it, does it uh, fuse with other crypts, or if, or if it fissions, creating a new, a new set of crypts? Okay, so it, so does does treating a patch as a unit when it consists of you know several hundreds of cells, I mean, how does what's the justification behind that? Because that's that's pretty that's interesting, I guess. Well, it is a it is a pretty rough calculation. Um, ideally, we would like to model each one of the crypts themselves, but because the disease it takes it takes place place in a time scale of fifty years. Um, we thought that that was um, good enough for a solution to just tease out what kind of scenario would be the most likely um, to get kids, to, to reproduce kids' data. Um, okay, cool. And it, it, it was a very clear cut kind of scenario division. So some of them, if you start growing them from the bottom with a continuous insult and just having them, having them divide, it will never really reach the height of the of the kind of Barrett's esophagus um, that that are being observed in fifty years, uh, fifty year old patients. Um, on the other hand, if the crypt, if if the if the segment is already established, and then there is like alterations that are being done through a gradient um, of of insults, having this cell turnover, this patch turnover, uh, then you can you can recapitulate the, um, the kind of data that she's observing. So it's, it's just a very, very rough, different, different scenario testing. Sure, sure. Okay, cool. Thank you. Cool. Once again, thank you very much, Arturo. Pleasure. Thank you for having me. Um, I'll catch up with you on the YouTubes. <laughs> you will. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Goodbye. Thanks, Arturo. Peace out. Bye.